enjoy a cup of tea for 15 minutes and come back to the auditorium. Thank you. Please be seated quickly. Kind reminder once again before we start the conference, please switch off your mobile phones. The first speaker for the day is Dr. Leonard Ranasinghe, the clinical professor, California North State University College of Medicine. So I would like to invite Dr. Rana Singha to talk on the topic, Emergency Management of Head Injury, Issues and Development. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Nishani. <coughs> good morning. Hope everybody had a good rest last night. Before I start my lecture, I want to 
mention one point Mr. Morse mentioned which really you know, struck me very clearly. I think it's something all of you probably should be thinking about and apply in your practice. As medical providers, all of us who are gathered here have some connection to medical practice. Some of us are direct medical providers, some of our teachers, so regardless we have some connection to medical practice. So when you see patients, think always you treat that patient as if it is somebody you love, somebody you, you know, care. So it could be your mother, your father, your brother, or whoever. Think of that patient as that because that will, that will give you an opportunity to be empathetic and caring. So think about it. <coughs> So, we'll talk about uh, head injury. Uh, approximately 500,000, which is about half a million in head injury cases are in the United States every year. The interesting thing about head injury is because majority of the patients who sustain injuries, majority of the severe inj head injury patients do not make it to the hospital because they have usually associated at length to occipital separation or they have high spinal cord injuries which you know will lead to apnea and sometimes they have multiple organ injuries so they don't really make it to the hospital but <coughs> fortunately I should say 75 percent of the patients we see with head injury they are minor they are not that serious but always concerning though you have still have to do your complete evaluation to make sure that you don't miss anything and 15% is what we call moderate and 10% uh, severe head injuries. So I just want to briefly give you a background on anatomy because this is relevant when we talk about head injuries. So the head, if you th think about, start with the scalp. The importance of scalp because scalp has very generous blood supply. And this is really important in children because you know, when children bleed, even a small amount of blood loss compared to us can be significant. So always think about that blood loss. And even in adults, if there's continuous blood loss, it can be serious. And in fact, I had a patient who we had a very difficult time to control bleeding, and he was profusely bleeding. And by the time we got the, you know, this was an adult who was not, in fact, not an anticoagulant, and he was just a regular about like 20 or 30 year old male patient and by the time we controlled and we monitored him his hemoglobin level had in fact dropped significantly and we had to admit that patient so even though we see as minor things on the scalp think about possible significant blood loss the skull <coughs> think about the skull the you know there's cranial vault and the base the base is irregular so when you have an acceleration or deceleration injury, the brain kind of slides forward and backwards. So if you have a rough surface at the bottom, brain is going to slide on that rough surface forward and backwards in acceleration and deceleration. You can expect that, you see, it can cause confusion. So just like if your arm, you know, rubs against a metal something or something solid, it can cause bruises and contusions the same thing which can happen on the brain. Those contusions may not be simple. They could be significant. We'll talk about that later. The other thing about the cranial vault is that the cranial vault, you know, has anterior fossa, middle fossa, and the posterior fossa. Then in the temporal area, there is, the bone is usually very thin, and the temporal artery, especially the middle meningeal artery, it goes right underneath that one, and that is significant. We'll talk about that a little later. So temporal bone, middle meningeal artery, and any injury to the temporal side, always think about some serious injuries. And I've had several patients who have had significant problems. <clears throat> now what about the meninges? Meninges are, are just the coverings on the brain. And it starts right underneath the skull with the dura mem membrane. You've heard of the dura membrane. It is a thick fibrous membrane which firmly adheres to the inner surface of the skull. So essentially there is no space there between the skull, in, inside of the skull and the dural membrane. However, in certain areas inside the skull, this dura kind of splits into two, you know, like a little pockets-like things, where the venous blood is drained into. Those are called venous sinuses. 
and that's significant. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, why this do, this space, these spaces are important. <clears throat> right underneath that is the arachnoid membrane. And the arachnoid membrane is a thin paper-like membrane, and there's a potential space between the dura and the arachnoid membrane. Now, again, that's significant because of the dural, you know, bleeding between the dura and the arachnoid membrane, which we call the subdural bleeding. <clears throat> then underneath that is the pia membrane or pia mera, which is almost firmly attached to the surface of the brain. And the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, is in that space between the pia membrane and the arachnoid membrane. And that is important because the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is the cushion for the brain as well as the spinal cord. And if there's bleeding in, the, in the, that space, subarachnoid space as we call it between these two layers, and th that blood is significant because when there's blood there, CSF cannot be reabsorbed. CSF is constantly recirculated. It's made and it's recirculated throughout the brain as well as the spinal cord. But if blood is there, the arachnoid villi, which are the reabsorbing parts of the brain, cannot reabsorb them. So what happens? Then the blood stays in there because blood's not getting, you know, rehab the CSF is not getting reabsorbed. The pressure increases, which can cause significant problems in the brain. <clears throat> so here's a structure. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer to mention, and uh, you may get this in your uh, CD later on, this picture, but the membranes are marked in this one. <clears throat> so brain has three main parts, most I think you all know, and I'm only going to talk about it from the point of your head injury. The cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. We all know about the cerebrum, which are the frontal lobe, the middle lobe, and you know, uh, things like that. And there are certain areas in the brain which are significant. So depending on where the injuries has occurred, their clinical presentation may be different. The brain stem has the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Now, why is this important? This is a very sensitive area of the brain. The midbrain and the upper pons contains what we call the reticular activating system, RAS. The reticular activating system is the one which keeps uh, us awake. So if there's a significant injury to this area, the patient may be comatose, unresponsive, because the reticular activating system has been affected. So when a patient comes with a head injury in comatose condition, this is one of the reasons, not the only reason. And then the medulla. Why is the medulla important? Because it has vital cardiorespiratory centers. Cardiorespiratory centers. So if anything happens to this area, the respirations get erratic, blood pressure can go out of control, and, you know, things like that happen. <coughs> uh, the other thing about this is, unfortunately, sometimes CT scans may not pick up injuries to this area clearly initially. And sometimes, you know, you may need an MRI scan, but of course, you see, that's a different thing which you have to do at a different time. Um, here's another important thing about the brain. Now, the, uh, there are two compartments in the brain. It's called the supratentorial and the infratentorial. The supratentorial part, yeah, the, the, these are, this is separated by a membrane called the tentorial, uh, tentorial uh, notch. And that's where the, the midbrain goes through. And the oculomotor nerve goes right at the edge of that. So why is this important? Oculomotor nerve is the third nerve. Right there, you see on the oculomotor nerve, or the third nerve, the uh, outer surface of that has the parasympathetic fibers. So parasympathetic fibers, as you know, causes the pupils to constrict. Sympathetic fibers cause the pupils to dilate. So those two work opposite. So if the brain is getting herniated and cause compression in that area, the third nerve gets compressed, the, the parasympathetic fibers which are now in the outer surface of that get compressed, so what do you see? Pupil gets dilated. So if a patient he has a one eye with the pupil, dilated pupil, the reason is that most likely the patient is herniating. So this is why this anatomy is helpful for you to know. <clears throat> the other important thing about this is he right where again, where this tentorial notch is the, where the midbrain goes through. Midbrain also has what we call the pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract, which is the motor fi fibers. And right there, it crosses to the opposite side. So when there's compression again in the midbrain, 
if the brain is herniating, midbrain is getting compressed, and what happens? The nerve, the motor fibers, the tract, gets compressed. So that because it's crossed over to the opposite side, you'll see if the bleeding is on the left side, your left pupil is dilated, but your right side is paralyzed. Or, you know, beginning to get, at least in the beginning stages, maybe we getting weaker, but eventually can get paralyzed. So that's why you say ipsilateral dilated pupil and contralateral paralysis indicates usually herniation. So that's what you need to suspect and start thinking about. <laughs> so anatomy is important from that point of view. Ipsilateral means same side, contralateral means opposite side. So a little bit of physiology as well. It, with intracranial pressure is very, very, very important. And it, usually the intracranial pressure is maintained at ten, about 10 millimeters of mercury. If it goes more than 20, that means it's a bad sign. And obviously we can measure that in the emergency department, but the neurosurgeons you know, you, you know, can measure that with the special instruments. So any time there's a head injury, the intracranial pressure go up. So elevated intracranial pressure not only may indicate that there's a presence of a problem, but it also contributes to that problem. So it kind of goes into a vicious cycle after that. So we'll talk about, you see, why, how we should, do, what we should do about that. So higher the intracranial pressure with the head injury, the worse is that outcome. So our objective should be you know, to do whatever we can to reduce that intracranial pressure. What is Monroe Kelly doctrine? Monroe Kelly doctrine essentially mentions you know, of that brain is a fixed volume compartment. It's kind of obvious. It's like uh, you know, if you take a soccer ball, for example, once it's inflated to the maximum, that's all you can inflate. But if in the, in the case of the brain, if you get a bleeding in the brain, now there's a third part. You see, you have the CSF, you have the brain tissue, you have the venous blood, you have the arterial blood. Now there's a fifth element now bleeding outside all those areas. So when there's an extra volume in the brain, brain cannot expand because of the skull, and something has to give in. So initially, what happens is there's a certain amount of CSF, and the venous blood will be kind of pushed out to maintain the intracranial pressure at a reasonable level. And, but it can only do to a certain level. As soon as they, it reaches that you know, critical point, immediately then the intracranial pressure shoots up within minutes to a few hours. So our objective is, again, not to let that happen. So what, uh, <clears throat> what is really important is not to allow the patient to get hypotensive because it can cause a severe secondary brain injury. Cerebral blood flow, we have to maintain adequate cerebral blood flow so that the patient will not sustain secondary brain injury. Primary injury is direct injury. Secondary injury is when the patient becomes either hypotensive due to hypovolemia, patient gets hypoxic, means not enough oxygen, and sometimes you see the, the carbon dioxide level, PCO2, can be different. If it is too low, it can cause vasoconstriction, and vasoconstriction causes cerebral ischemia, and if, it, if the PCO2 is too high, it causes vasodilation, which can, causes, which can cause edema of the brain. So it is not easy to balance this. So you have to be very careful. So in these patients, we monitor their PCO2 levels very, very carefully. So in those patients, not only the oxygen has to be measured, but you have to also monitor the PCO2 levels. So the primary object, like I said, is to um, reduce the secondary brain injury. And if you remember that, in brain head injury, prevent secondary brain injury, that covers the entire lecture. And you can leave now. So that's the bottom line. Always remember, you know, prevent secondary brain injury. But since you are here, I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, how do you classify head injuries? You can classify by mechanism, severity, and morphology. And uh, mechanism, it could be the blunt trauma or penetrating tra trauma, which is kind of straightforward, and you can understand that. And they, that in, <coughs> um, under blunt and penetrating trauma, you also get skull fractures. The skull fractures are classified as linear skull fractures or stellate, you know, or depressed or open skull fractures. Under <clears throat> and the severity of injury, we use the Glasgow Coma Scale. And I'm sure most of, most of you have seen DSF, right, in your books and studied. 
the GCS? Yes? No? Okay. But if you want to quickly go through, remember there are three elements you have to check. The eye opening, verbal response, and best motor response. And I'm not going to go into detail, but the score is given according to that. You see, as you can see. So when you get a chance, review that, because this is something you have to document as a nurse, as a physician. And this must be documented because when the patient comes in, the GCS level may be 15, meaning completely normal. But an hour later, GCS could be 9. So that means, you see, if you had documented at the beginning what the GCS level, then you know that the patient has de you know, deteriorated. So you have to do something about it. And when you document GCS score, I have seen, in fact, some of, them, some of the junior doctors are documenting GCS score 12. And I look at it and says, what does it mean? It doesn't mean much to me, I say. You have to give the each category, E, I, how many? V, how many? Because that way we can get an idea what each you know, element was at the beginning. The total score alone is not enough. So always specify the eye-opening score, verbal response score, and the best motor response score. <clears throat> so if you want to classify this head injury is according to the severity, then you need to think about that GCF, GCS of 13 to actually it's not 14, it's 15. So GCS 13 to 15 is mild brain injury, and that's what we said about 75% of the people we see in the emergency department. Nine, between 9 and 12 is moderate injury, and 8 or less is considered severe. So coma, a patient has a GCS of 8 is almost always is in coma, and those patients we always intubate. In fact, personally, I intubate if the GCS score is nine because I expect that somebody that low, you know, you expect the patient to go further as a precaution. I would, you know, do that. That's my personal choice. But the recommendation is that a GCS of eight, you know, you have to intubate that patient uh, and connect to a ventilator to protect, you know, so the airway and things like that. So we talked about skull injuries. I got some. Um, um, pictures. Now remember, skull fractures, don't confuse with the natural sutures brain a skull has. So this is a suture line actually. And these are suture lines what you see. And they are not fracture lines. <clears throat> now middle and meningeal artery, you can see it's going on the groove on the temporal bone area right there. And the left, you know, picture and right picture. And if there's a fracture, you see that will, that artery will get lacerated and the bleeding will occur in the epidural area. Well, we'll talk about it. I also already mentioned about the skull fractures, the linear fractures, uh, depressed and opening, uh, and the open fractures. They are significant because depressed and open uh, fractures, you know, that could be, may have a communication between the brain, CSF fluid may be leaking, and those patients have to be extremely carefully managed and neurosurgeons must be notified. And remember, even if you see a simple skull fracture, it takes a lot of force to cause a skull fracture. So, it, you know, that patient has sustained significant head injury. Sometimes these patients do well, but at least you have to think about it and, you know, observe these, these patients carefully. It, you know, you, the estimate is that, you see, if there's a skull fracture, 400, there's 400 times more risk for them to have an intracranial injury. So here are some skull fractures. Here's a linear fracture, two linear fractures. And here's a depressed fracture, which of course you cannot really say on the picture, but if you palpate this patient's fracture area, you can feel the bone dipping. And of course you have to wear sterile gloves to do that. And this, this, this diastatic fracture means that fracture goes along the suture line, so they kind of sutures separate, opening the skull a little bit more. <coughs> So, the other way is according to the uh, morphology, and so brain injuries so you can divide as focal, diffuse, and secondary. In the focal brain lesions, we have the epidural injuries, or epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas, and intracerebral hematomas. Diffuse brain injuries, it can be mild, or it could be severe. In mild cases, you may have a completely normal CT scan, and patient may be completely normal. They may have a history of, you see, uh, some loss of consciousness or something like that. But in the case of diffuse brain injuries, uh, what happens is, you, when you look at the CT scan, 
You don't see bleeding or anything, but you will see some abnormalities and I'm going to show you in a little bit. So epidural hematomas, they are located outside the dura. Now remember the me membranes I mentioned? Right underneath the skull is the dural membrane. And remember I said the spaces are open you know, in certain areas. There are, you know, the middle meningeal artery goes on this side especially, and this is the most common, although it can be caused by venous bleeding as well, but most commonly it's a fracture of the temporal bone causing the laceration of the middle meningeal artery, and that bleeding is now between the uh, dura and the skull. That's why you call epidural. Epi means outside, so epidural. And they're not that common. They're about only 0.5%, but, you know, about 10% of those people can go into severe, you know, uh, problems. I had a patient once, a motorcycle rider. This was long, long before CT scans were available in every hospital in the U.S. I was working in Ohio at the time, and CT scan was in the other state in Indiana. So we had only we had to send the patient by helicopter if we wanted to get a CT scan. So the patient was completely alert and oriented, and I talked to the admitting doctor. I said, let's observe the patient in the ICU. And about four hours later, that patient started dilating his pupil. It then started becoming is he more somnolent, and fortunately, we were able to fly him out immediately to the other hospital with the CT scan. He had epidural hematoma, and he did okay. But these patients will what we call talk and die because in the, they come, they they may they have a lucid interval, but they can deteriorate quickly, and so you have to be careful. The thing about you know <coughs> um, now here's an epidural hematoma. When you look at it, you see you see the shape of it. It's like the shape of a lens. And the reason is because, you see, this bleeding does not cross the suture lines. So it just, you see, only that area it just gets puffed up because dura gets just pushed it towards the brain. But if it is not corrected, if the bleeding continues, it keeps pushing the brain. As you can see, the ventricles, you see those black things in the upper part, those are the ventricles. See how the one ventricle on that side is completely now pushed in? And the midline, if you look at it, has been pushed in as well. So, subdural hematoma. This is more common than epidural hematomas, but it has a high mortality. Now, some people do okay. And this is more common among older patients. The reason is because, you see, there are what we call bridging veins from the surface of the brain, surface of the brain, going into those venous sinuses. And those uh, bridging veins, you see, yeah, of course, they are so microscopic in a way, but at the same time they are significant. What happens when we get older? I'm not talking about myself now, okay? So, I'm <laughs> talking about you see somebody who's, you know, but anyway, as you get older what happens to the brain, brain shrinks a little bit, you know, so if you look at my brain, it might be sh shrunk a little bit, so my wife tells me that sometimes. So, so when that happens, you see, when the brain shrinks a little bit, those veins get a little bit more stretched. So they become more, you know, susceptible, vulnerable for to get, you know, injured easily, lacerated easily, break easily. So when you have that kind of a problem, and they, those will bleed, and that will cause the subdural hematoma. So subdural hematomas, that's why in older people, when they have a head injury, we are very careful, we almost always get a, CT scan, and <clears throat> and also remember, older people in addition, maybe on aspirin, maybe on warfarin or some other anticoagulant. So they are more susceptible. So, but subdural hematomas are also can they also can occur in other people, not only older people. So early diagnosis is extremely essential. Now, sub, the subdural hematomas can be classified into three groups as acute which is less than three days, subacute, which is three days to three weeks, and chronic, which could be after three weeks. I had a patient, uh, uh, African-American, we don't call blacks anymore, he's an African-American person, and he came when I was working in Washington, D.C. area. Um, he's a very interesting guy. He just walked in. He was, I still remember this man, and he said, uh, I hear music. I said, we all thought he had a little psychiatric problem. I asked him what kind of music, and he said, country music. I don't know if you know what country music is in the U.S. It's a kind of a you know, special type of music. And then he said, I even don't like country music. So I started thinking, he said, this is strange, but 
just, you know, I went back and uh, you know, after a while I went back and I talked to him, did you have a head injury any time? And he said, yeah, about three months back I was walking under a staircase in the apartment building he was living in. I said, I, I struck my head on the you know, staircase. And he was about 55 years old, but he was an alcoholic also. So they are more susceptible to these things. You see, their brains also shrink a little bit, even younger than you see our older people. I mean, uh, uh, older people like me. So, uh, got a CT scan. He had a subdural hematoma, and that's a chronic subdural hematoma. Fortunately, he did not have a serious issue, but for the rest of the, his life, he'll have to listen to country music. Now, here's another. Here's a subdural hematoma. Now, if you recall the one I showed earlier. And this one, you see a difference, right? This is not lens shaped. The blood, this is the white part, by the way. And this is the, I cannot, you see the white part on the left hand side of the picture? And that's spread, you know, kind of thin all the way down. And all it goes all the way down because it can cross the suture lines. So it can spread all the way down. But it can also cause the pressure, and that's why you see the ventricles, those black things on the, in the middle, have been pushed to the right. And if you look at the midline from the top, and see the midline has been shifted as well. So this patient has significant head in, uh, brain injury. Here's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which happens underneath the uh, arachnoid membrane, between the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater. And here's a bleeding inside the ventricle, significant bleeding inside the ventricle. Sometimes this happens not only due to trauma, when there's hyper uncontrolled hypertension, it can bleed on the side of the ventricle, but they can get into the ventricles as well. So, <clears throat> contusions. These are fairly common. And, and they can be associated with subdural hematomas or even epidural hematomas because of the head injury. And <clears throat> when there's a contusion, what happens is you have a head injury, and it's a like when you fall down, sometimes you get a little blue patch on your arm or a leg. Confusion. It's similar to that. There's a little bit blood spot on the brain, and sometimes you may see more than one. The danger about contusions is that you see here's here's a contusion. Here's pictures, two pictures with contusion. The white stuff is the blood. What happens is they can kind of coalesce together. As the day hours goes go go by, they can coalesce, and then it can cause a significant problem. So those patients, even if they're completely normal, neurologically intact. And you need to admit them, or at least watch them for several hours, yeah, because th those can cause problems, and repeat the CT scan if necessary. And, you know, they can cause sometimes some neurological deficits. So, we talked about diffuse uh, brain injuries earlier, and I'm going to skip that. So, diffuse axonal injury, like I said earlier, the brain CT scan what happens is, is uh, it gets swollen diffusely. You don't see blood, but the, the, the brain gets swollen. And it, when you look at the CT scan, you'll see that there's lots of gray and white matter on the edges. And I have a CT scan picture. I'll show you that one. And the ventricles, which are normally, which you can see with the fluid-filled, you know, uh, CSF-filled ventricles, they are compressed, what we call slit-like you know, appearance. You see, that means the whole brain has swollen edema. And here's a normal brain. You can see, if you look at the edge of the brain, you see this gyri and, you know, gray and white matter margins right there, fairly clear. Ventricles are nice and good size. And if you, and say it's another normal vent, you know, CT. And here's what happened in diffuse axonal injury. Do you see those margins, you know, like the one you heard earlier? Uh, here's compare this margin, uh, the margin of this brain and compared to this one, it's kind of smoothened out because of the swelling. And you don't see the ventricles clearly. So there is no blood, but it has caused edema. This, this type of thing usually happens when there is some kind of an insult at the time of the injury. So if there's an accident or something or a fall, and the patient has either has a, had a blood loss causing hypovolemia or you know, shock, and also if the patient sustained a hypoxic injury to the brain, and that can cause this, you know, this kind of problem. And this, usually these patients don't do very well, and they can get you know, significant you know, uh, neurological deficits. So how do you manage a head injury? General principles. First, 
after you do your you know evaluation if the patient is hemodynamically stable you do a ct scan remember if the patient is not hemodynamically stable your primary survey is to resuscitate these patients to stabilize this patient before you do that kind of thing so you know studies if the patient is sent to ct scan in an unstable situation you're going to have a severe problem in your hands so always manage the patient stabilize the patient then ct scan and always remember to protect the c spine remember i said the other day yesterday in my lecture you know if a patient had a head injury suspect the c spine injury always unless proven otherwise so always think about the c spine injury you must always get alcohol and drug levels but don't forget to get glucose level like mr most mentioned in his lecture yesterday is in patient who comes in any kind of unresponsive unresponsive situation regardless of his trauma or medical you know, situation unresponsive patient you must get uh, glucose level check because hypoglycemia can cause go back a little bit and see the okay and see how the you know gray and white matter you can see this uh, gyri coming in and the here's the ventricles and the ventricles are nice and this is filled with csf and then if you come here it's all that gyri and the gray and white matter is lost you cannot see the ventricles because it's here deep so when you want to consider ct ct scan you really don't want a ct scan everybody who comes in you know but you must do it if you feel that clinically it's necessary there are some guidelines you know they are not rules and regulations but guidelines you can use if the patient had a gcs score of less than 15 after 2 hours of the injury think about it. if the patient has definitely an open skull fracture there's no you know that's a given you must do it and if you if the patient has a basal skull fracture with you know barrel sign hemotympanum racuna sign and otorrhea rhinorrhea so let me take a couple of minutes to explain this now basal skull fracture it can cause either with or without csf leak or also with or without seventh nerve or eighth nerve damage seventh nerve is facial nerve and eighth nerve is hearing and if you if you don't have those you get the raccoon eyes that's a retroperit retroperitoneal hematoma have you seen patients with a their head injury they have blood all the purple around the eyes and some and then the purple be purple color behind the ear that's a retroperitoneal hematoma so i want to tell you a little story about this this might embarrass my wife so we were in saudi arabia and one day she was with a bunch of little kids and i was you know i think at home or at work i can't remember anyway she was kind of running with these kids tripped on the curb fell right on her face and she came home fully bruised up next day she had raccoon eyes she had a teeny bit of blood on the chin you know, behind the ear fortunately no seventh nerve paralysis no eighth nerve paralysis no csf leaks so csf leaks is when csf fluid leaks through the nose which is rhinorrhea or if it leaks through the ear which is otorrhea she didn't have those so i talked to one of my neurosurgery colleagues and he said leonard since she doesn't have all those signs she's allergic to that no lot of consequences just keep an eye on her since you're a physician if something happens you know changes let me know so next day she was actually much better little sore little headache but she was fine but she went about doing shopping things like that all our friends who met her in the shopping complex and things i would look at her and kind of avoided her didn't ask her what happened and this went on for about a week and then one day she and i were together at the shopping center and uh, another friend of mine a physician and his wife came by and we stopped to talk and my friend of course is a physician he said leonard you know sharon what happened to you and she kind of you know didn't say anything right away and i said very straight face with a straight face i said she did not put enough salt in my food 
because they, a lot of people before that didn't ask because they thought I beat her up. So spousal abuse, yes. If a woman comes, for that matter, even a man comes to the you know emergency department with injuries like that, you must think about spousal abuse. Trust me, I did not hit my wife. She wouldn't be here today if I did. <laughs> no, but anyway, we're talking about spousal abuse. Uh, one of the nurses one day uh, when I was working in Virginia came. She's a you know strong woman. She came. She was fully bruised up, injured. And, of course, she was brought by ambulance, and then, you know, I didn't see her, the other physician saw her. But I asked her, actually, her boyfriend beat her up. But three, two, three, four, three, la three, four days later, I went to work, and the boyfriend came by ambulance, fully injured. And I asked the news, what happened? She beat him up. And I said, good for her. He deserved it. Anyway, think about spousal abuse. It can be and children. So I think Mr. Morse touched on that subject yesterday. Always suspect children or even adults, elderly people, you know, so think about that. So anyway, if you see signs of those like that, CT scan is indicated. Vomiting, you know, the recommendation is to if you vomit more than twice, you know, but it is kind of a, you know, clinical decision. Older people, see, more than 65 years, but then again, like I said, if you suspect some clinical, with a clinical, you know, problem, you can get a CT scan even if they are under, than, under 65. Definitely patients on anti anticoagulation medications, but I think one of our, our colleagues is, uh, did a study, uh, did the Vincent study on... Uh, Head injury and CT scans on is it published yet? Yeah, so that's, that's a study done. One of our colleagues who worked with me, uh, you know, at the hospital did a study whether they really need a CT scan or not. I have not seen that yet, but as of now, with the patients on head uh, anticoagulation medications with a head injury, CT scan may be indicated. Pediatric patients, and because there's so much radiation. We try to reduce, we observe, I like to, if the child is playing, running around, active, I tell the mother, would you like to wait a few hours because I really don't want to radiate this child with a lot of CT scans, you see. Because you have to be, think of, be concerned about that. There's a lot of radiation in CT scans, and especially children. So we observe them. But there's one indication, a recent research said, if there's a, about children about two years older, toddler age, if they have a significant scalp hematoma, that may be an indication to get a CT scan. Uh, <clears throat> loss of consciousness of more than five minutes. And again, it's a judgment call. If the patient is amnesic, my son had a fall play, playing football, which is American football, and he was brought by his friends to the house, and he was confused. He kept asking the same question over and over and over again, and he, was com he couldn't remember anything, you know, what we said. And I took him to the ER myself, and we got a CT scan. Fortunately, he was okay, and he's, he was fine next day. So those are, you know, mild concussions. And if, if the mechanism of injury you suspect was a dangerous mechanism, you know, like a high-speed motor vehicle accident, falling from a ladder from a fairly, you know, high up, things like that. The patient is symptomatic if they have a significant headache. If the patient had a seizure after the injury, and if they definitely, if the patient has some focal neurological findings, then you must get a CT scan. That is important. So we need to do a mini neurological exam during our evaluation. The purpose is to determine how severe the brain injury is. We need to then, that way you can monitor the deterioration, meaning here's the, here are the findings now. Two hours later, it may be different. So that's why you have to monitor, document the time, like I said yesterday. Always document the time and document, document your findings in detail. And then the next person, if you're not there, your shift is over. The next person who comes along can compare his, his or, or her findings with your findings. And then, of course, you see, you need to document all the other injuries as well. So the things you now want to document, of course, you see, level of consciousness, which we use GCS.
and we know we talked about that already. Check the pupils. Are they dilated? Are they reactive? And see if there's any motor weakness as well. Um, so how do you manage mild head injury? Like I said, 75% fortunately are mild. You, they may have a history of disorientation, amnesia, and they may have transient loss of consciousness, but now they are awake and alert and oriented and talking. But unfortunately, now this is GCS of 15 now. GCS of 15, but 3% of these patients may deteriorate. So you need to either observe some of these patients or give appropriate instructions to the person who's going to take that patient home, a responsible ad adult. Now if the patient comes with another fully intoxicated, drunk friend, you can discharge that patient to that person. So in that case, you may have to keep the patient until somebody responsible comes, but that is the, always think about it. So ideally, we can think about CT scans in these patients. The study was done, 658 patients classified as minor head injuries between GCS of between 13 to 14. 18% of them had abnormal head C, initial head CTs, but doesn't mean they all had problems. Only about 0.5% needed surgery. A GCS of 13, 25% had abnormal initial head CT and 1.3 required surgery. So you have to always think about this even though it's a minor head injury. Skull x-rays, these, these days we don't do it. And in rural area, if there's no CT scan, if you want to look, check for, you know, maybe skull fractures or air in the, you know, inside intracranial air or something like that is helpful. See, spine, remember, like I said, it's important. So if you want to discharge a patient with mild head injuries, always give a head injury instruction sheet. And we have a standard instruction sheet we give to all our patients, a printed paper. In addition to that, I personally always kind of go through those, this verbally one by one, and I always ask them, do you have any questions before you leave? Which I ask every patient before they are discharged. <clears throat> so if the patient has, you know, uh, normal CT, you, you remember you can discharge. If the patient has no companion, you may want to observe in the ER or admit if necessary. Abnormal CT is definitely you need to admit them or, you know, contact the neuro neurosurgeon. Here are the discharge instructions for uh, uh, if, if you are going to discharge the patient. And tell the, tell the family, if the patient becomes increasingly drowsy, try to wake the patient up every few hours to see if he or she can recognize you. And even children, I say that, you see, if, you can, if their child can recognize you, and if they have nausea and vomiting, if they have seizures, we call fits here, if they have discharge or bleeding, if they complain, I, am, I have some weakness or numbness or in one side of the body, if they have confusion or erratic behavior, Check the pupil at home with a flashlight, you call a torch. And if the vital signs, like if the heart is beating too fast or irregular, things like that, which usually our you know, families can check. How much time do I have? Time's up. So I'll take five minutes. to. So moderate head injuries, 15%. They all need heat CT scans. These patients can still follow commands but are confused and approximately 10 to 20% can deteriorate and manage like you know, severe. Severe head injuries, these patients, we don't have time. We have to aggressively treat them because they are usually multiple injuries and they can be really serious. So they are the ones you have to be really careful to make, make sure there's no secondary brain injury. And they cannot follow simple commands and they're usually, usually hypotensive or hypoxic. So you have to address those issues. So primary survey, manage the airway if necessary, intubate. If they are hypotensive, address that issue with the blood fluid. Remember I said yesterday, head injury does not cause hypovolemia, you know, hypotension unless late stages they can get hypotension when their medullary compression is involved. And hyperventilation, be very careful not to overhyperventilate. So always treat the hypotension. Neurological exam, you do that. We already talked about the neurological exam, but I want to mention a few other things quickly, and unless uh, and I'm you know, kicked out of here. So management. A medical therapy is a quickly mentioned. So patients with hypotension, make sure you hydrate them with either 
fingers lactate or normal saline, but you have to be careful not to overdo it because if you give too much fluid too soon, it can cause cerebral edema. So be careful. And remember, do not use any IV fluids with glucose because the brain, in a patient with head injury, brain is not ready to metabolize. So you don't need that. That's not necessary unless they are hypoglycemic. So if they are normal sugar or even high sugar, remember, you only use normal saline without glucose or rigorous lactate. Now, hyperventilation, I want to quickly touch because this is important. Many years ago, it was advocated that these patients needed to be hyperventilated. It is not so now. The idea is to maintain now is to maintain the PCO2 of 35, which is the low end of normal. Normal PCO2 is between 35 to 45. The only time you <laughs> hyperventilate, it's recommended for hyperventilation, is that the patient is deteriorating in front of you. And if a normal patient who comes now has, has new neurological deficits, so you talk to the neurosurgeon, say he's going downhill, I'll start hyperventilating briefly, not for a long time, and give it hyperventilate and maintain a PCO2 of 25 to 30 to help to cause vasoconstriction. Remember, if it is too much vasoconstriction, it can cause EC ischemia of the brain. So that's why we don't want to you know, do that for too long. Manitol, again, if the patient is deteriorating, you can give manitol. The manitol is a strong osmotic diuretic, so therefore it can cause EC. Uh, patient sometimes can cause hypotension. If the patient is already hypotensive, you don't want to give manitol. So routine use of manitol is not recommended. Again, if that patient is deteriorating, you not talk to the neurosurgeons. And Lasix can go along with it. Steroids have no place in trauma. You, we don't give steroids anymore for head injuries. You know, spinal cord injury maybe is a different issue, but not in the head injury. And barbiturates, some, this, is, this has been used. This is used even in some places. The idea is that this will help to reduce the intracranial pressure and reduces the metabolic rate. But again, you cannot use, it, use this if the patient is already hypotensive because barbiturates can cause hy further hypotension. So you don't want to compound the problem. Anti-convulsants, about 5% of head injury patients can uh, <clears throat> leave, you know, <clears throat> develop seizures or fits later in life. Three main factors for late epilepsy or fits, early seizures within the first week, intracranial hematoma, depressed skull fracture. So the common anti-convulsants you need to use either phenobarbital or phenytoin, uh, it, but you don't give phenytoin prophylactically. In fact, it, there's some public research published to show that EC, uh, phenytoin can cause EC inhibition of the brain, uh, rehabilitation uh, of the brain. So only if there are seizures. Now, when the patient is actively having fits, you give Valium uh, or lorazepam or diazepam and benzodiazepine. But remember, that only controls the muscle activity. It doesn't control the actual brain activity. So, Many times doctors will give that and feel comfortable that the patient ha is now okay. It's not so. So remember, if you give benzodiazepines, it first treats the doctors and the nurses because they feel quite happy that the patient is looking better. But you have to always accompany that with an anticonvulsant. <clears throat> Scalp bleeding, control with, you know, make sure they are clean really well, irrigate them, remove all foreign bodies, look for CSF leaks, look for skull fractures, and suture as necessary. And then uh, early neuros neurosurgical intervention if the patient has intracranial hematomas or if there's significant neurological deficits. And uh, burr holes, quickly. You see, burr holes were recommended many years ago, and especially in rural areas because then there's no neurosurgeon. But burr holes, you know, I, I, today we don't recommend because two things. When you do burr holes, you're going blindly, and you may not hit the actual hematoma. Secondly, burr hole is only about 10 to 15 millimeters in diameter, and some of the blood may come out, but then it gets blocked, clogged up, and so it doesn't really do any good. See, if you're really in a bind like that, you can do a bone flap craniotomy, which I cannot do. It has to be done by a, specially, by a surgeon who has been trained to do that. So I think uh, Dr. Gunatilaka may have you know, an experience that in the areas where he has practiced before. And finally, brain death, it says no, this is the point of no recovery for brain function. And how do you diagnose this? GCS of three, 
pupils dilated and non-reactive, no brain reflexes, meaning uh, doll's eye and uh, you know, caloric cold reflexes. Absent, they don't have any breathing response on their own. So how do you confirm that? You can do an EEG, you can do a cerebral, cerebral blood flow study, and high, all, you, know, you can do those tests and cerebral angiography. But remember, those who have had hypothermia, exposure to you know, low temperatures, or hypothermic already, or barbiturates, may give a false brain death. So you have to let those things first you know, get, you know, warm the body or barbiturates to be removed from the body before you can determine that. In children, sometimes, you see, you need to delay the, the deciding the brain death because they have a remarkable capable capacity to recover, so you need to give more, more time. And if you suspect that this patient is brain death, brain dead, but other vital signs are still intact, you need to contact the organ harvesting after you get, got, get the consent from the family members. Uh, <clears throat> summary, initial manage, management of the head injury patient is very critical. Always do the ACBCDE approach. Of course, most of these things are done simultaneously. The most important thing is that it prevents secondary brain damage with appropriate uh, treatment for hypovolemia and hypoxia. And make sure you identify the patients who need immediate surgery because you don't want to delay those as soon as the patient is stabilized hemodynamically. And then make sure you have transfer these patients to higher level of care where neurosurgery is available in a timely manner. And this is about two hours from my home, Yosemite Valley. It's a beautiful, beautiful area, the waterfall. And this is South Lake Tahoe, again, which is about two hours from my home, a beautiful place. My wife and I sometimes go and have a little day tour there and have a picnic and enjoy and come back in the evening. It's only two hours. And that's South Lake Tahoe also. Thank you, and I'm sorry. I apologize for taking extra time. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Garmini.